My name is Anna Kasakultima, and this is Games Now. Games Now is an open lecture series run by Aalto University on the hot topics and developments within game industry and maker communities. In order to take the full advantage of our content, make sure that you follow us and subscribe us on YouTube, Facebook, and other social media channels. When we talk about games, we often talk about fun. The lightheartedness and escapistic nature of video games has brought us joy and enjoyment, as well as helped us cope with the realities outside the game's sphere. And this has been for many decades now. In 2019, games are part of a multifaceted, expressional toolset for human experiences. There is not a single topic that games could not cover. And games are not meant for only fun for certain audiences. Today's speaker will share their insight um, as a designer and a scholar on the power of games as a meaningful medium. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Sabine Harre. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction, Akko, uh, and welcome to my talk, Playing with Grief. I am here indeed as um, part of two identities. One identity um, is I'm a game maker and member of the Copenhagen Game Collective. And the second identity is that I'm also a scholar, postdoctoral researcher at Tampere University. And uh, in this talk today, I'm trying to activate both of these identities to share some insights or findings from my past work in my PhD, which was exactly about grief and games. So the research question of this project was basically, is it possible to mourn in a playful way? And at first glance, this seems like a contradictory question or a absurd question even for some. Because as Akko pointed out before, games and play are about fun or are supposed to be about fun and about happiness and what could be less happy than a loss or uh, the feeling of grief. But in 2011, when I started my research, I wanted to break with this binary. It felt like a binary to me, uh, because there was a clear link for me between bereavement and games. And I didn't understand this link yet, but I wanted to dig a bit deeper and find out what it was about. And so I spent some years actually writing this book, Games and Bereavement, which is now available. Uh, it all started, yes, with a theoretical interest in this topic, but also with a deep personal involvement in the subject. Uh, I had some skin in the game, so to speak, and uh, it's I want to start this talk by sharing with you a personal story about, basically about disappointment in games or more likely with this person. That's my son, uh, Nico. And uh, he was born uh, on July 3rd, 2004. This is a long time ago. Uh, and uh, he had very strong thighs already as a small baby and he had very soft voice uh, and a tiny red mole on the uh, right on top of his left eyebrow. And this picture was taken two weeks after Nico was born, and some days before we uh, took him to the hospital. Uh, when we arrived, uh, this was found in Nico's brain. I uh, don't know who of you is a scientist, but this is um, a streptococcus bacteria that causes meningitis. And in Nico's case, there was very bad news because he died at the end of July. That was some weeks before The Sims 2 came out, and also some weeks before uh, I enrolled in university. Um, both, of, both of these opportunities 
university and The Sims 2, I embraced to work through my new identity. This is my new identity as an ex-mom. And so how did it go? Uh, well, for the university part, it felt really weird hanging around at university parties uh, while also being an ex-mom because there were some active moms who were sort of invited to share their experiences and joke about their little kids' um, strange habits and failings, and I could talk about my kids' failing, so to speak, at life. Um, so that was one experience I had there. The other side, The Sims 2, uh, was kind of a, a realm of escapism for me, and I used it to, uh, to kind of cope with my situation uh, by rebuilding the situation in The Sims 2. That was a way for me to process it. And I was able to design two young adults uh, to the liking of my partner and myself back then. Uh, but then when the baby was born, first it went through, a, the game went through a weird sanitary animation that felt nothing like real birth. And the second thing was that at the point when Nico was supposed, supposed to die, The Sims 2 resisted. The game did not let me represent my experience and it literally did not support my place in life, even though this game was supposedly about life. Uh, so by disabling the death of babies, the game symbolically erased the experience of thousands of other ex-mothers and parents like me uh, and expressing this unspeakableness of our fate through its mechanics. And I realized that The Sims 2 was not alone in this. The repression of death and loss seemed baked into the systems of video games. So how? Here's the sort of scheme of how, what video games do when they represent death usually, traditionally. Um, what is typical is we try to jump over something and we fail and then death awaits us. And the function is basically to tell you that you're bad at what you're doing. It's your fault, you're a bad gamer if you die. Um, but actually there's a second layer in this representation of death as failure. Um, because if you're going through this death and you have a game overstate, what does the game do, do, do next? It tells you, it almost pleads you to continue. Um, you should try again. And so death isn't actually about death, it's about immortality. And death is a feedback func function like the blinking light on my dishwasher. I don't know whether you have a dishwasher, but there's this light telling you to refill salt. And this is the same in video game death. It tells you to be a better gamer and to work through your experience through immortality. Um, so this is basically my first grasp of what video games do when they represent loss and grief. They trivialize it. Uh, because I found a lot of these dishwasher deaths in video games. And um, it started to bore me. Uh, because I, I realized that it didn't really represent and engage with, with, with what it felt like for me to see a loved one die. So it was crucial. I had some stake here to find gameplay expressions that care about not only my loss experience, but thousands of other people's loss experiences out there, instead of trivializing it. Because if games are kind of artistic or expressive media, then they were clearly failing at something here. But where to start with this project of trying to find or recover meaningful expressions of loss and grief? I'll walk you a bit through um, stages in this process, and uh, this is the overview for the rest of this talk. So first, my first step was to find good grief examples in video games. So video games that represented loss beyond this dishwasher death. Um, the second stage was to actually um, decide to work with grievers 
in order to translate their experience or work with their experience in video games that I could make as a creator. Um, and this takes me to this making of the actual video game, Jokoi, which means sheep game in Romanian, as, just, uh, as, a, as a kind of concession to some members uh, of our design team who were from Romania. And, um, and then I'll just finish this off with a, with a short conclusion about playing with grief. So I've been told that it would be better if you have any questions. I usually don't mind if you ask them during the talk, but since we have a more complex technical setup, um, maybe you just remember them, and then afterwards we can have a Q&A about it. How does that sound? Okay, great. There will also be spoilers uh, or content warning or whatever. Um, there will be a small exercise during this talk, so just to prepare you a bit for, there will be one small interactive session that's part of our method that, we, that I used with the grievers. So let's get started on the first part, finding good grief in video games. Um, so again, I looked for games that treat death beyond the simple principle of the game over mechanic. And I did that by looking at relationships between in-game characters. So there's lots of other possible way, probably ways to explore this question or to find good grief, but that was what I chose, to look at in-game representations and how characters were treated inside of games. Uh, video games, I have to add, it's not board games, it's specifically video games. Um, and what I found is that video games succeed at rich representations of loss if they treat attachment and love in a respectful way, if they sort of take attachment seriously. Uh, so if, if there's a strong bond between characters to begin with, there's also a higher chance that uh, players will be moved by the loss or kind of make the loss more relatable. And I will talk about briefly about three examples that I analyzed in, in my book as well. Um, and a massive spoiler alert. This, I probably already, I already spoil it by just putting these video games here. There is loss in them. But I will talk about some of the mechanics or design strategies that uh, creators use to represent grief. And this in necessarily includes spoilers. Um, for those who believe in spoilers. Okay, so Aiko, that first game here to the left is called Aiko, and uh, that's a, a Japanese indie game from 2011, uh, uh, 2001, sorry, and it tells the story of, um, of a horned boy, the titular Aiko, or Iko, who tries to escape an enchanted castle with uh, the fragile princess Yorda, that you see here on the right, um, is there, who knows Aiko, show of hands? Okay, great, so half of you, great. Um, so we make sense of this escape tour through Aiko's perspective, and uh, that's also the perspective through which this relationship to Yorda is navigated and established. And as players, uh, we, uh, we kind of navigate Aiko through spatial puzzles, many of which require holding Yorda's hand and helping her, her over a cliff or fighting monsters which uh, threaten to pull her into dark holes. And over the course of many hours, the game uh, makes us obsessed with Yorda. And it establishes some kind of codependency relationship, uh, maybe a bit unhealthy, but effective as an attachment sort of mechanic. Um, and of course, this, uh, as you can probably guess from my brief description, this relationship is full of gendered cliches. So the little boy tries to play the savior by banging his erect sword against shadow monsters. And he's also the one being offensive, being quick and aggressive. And Yorda is the one who's fragile, who is different, who's, uh, whose language cannot be understood and who's almost translucent here and completely helpless. Uh, she cannot fight and is dependent on, on Aiko's protection, but she can open doors, so we need her. Um, so um, there's something to be said about how cleverly this toxic relationship is uh, realized on the gameplay level, though. 
So there's one button on the controller to the right, um, uh, top right, the right shoulder button on the PlayStation controller uh, that's used to call Yoda over and hold her hand and help her jump over an abyss uh, and so on. So over the hours, we repetitively press this button as a part of the core gameplay. And Yoda becomes our, um, th that's, that's the haptic level, uh, dimension on which Yorda becomes part of our little obsessive compulsive world. And um, what is interesting is that Yorda tra trusts Aiko since she, she accommodates Aiko's calls whenever we press the button, she does something. Uh, but we never know for sure what she really wants or why she wants to be our partner to begin with. So there's some paranoia about, like lost fantasy about that as well. Um, is she really into us or does she only follow us because we made her do so, we don't really know. Um, but it all gets worse when we uh, eventually lose her. And this uncertainty of this relationship is, is gnawing, it gets worse. Um, and she's gone, she's taken away by an almighty shadow queen, I told you there will be spoilers. And what's interesting is that we can, can still call her, we can still use the bot button and I will call out for her, but um, our Goal, our call kind of goes into the void um, and, and Yoda literally ghosts us and there's no explanation for why, um, except she's gone. Um, so on the gameplay level, the game really uh, does well in taking portions of the gameplay away from us. Uh, there's no fighting after Yoda is gone. There's no, no banging uh, shadow monsters. Uh, that was, and Yoda was super important kind of to give us a point in life to kind of actually realize our kind of boyish masculinity. And um, the game also does a lot of on all kind of other visual and audio levels to support this loss feeling or this gameplay deprivation. Um, because before we have been wandering high up on the castle of the, on, on the heights of the level and after Yorda's loss or with Yorda's lo loss, we literally fall down to the foundations of the castle and have to climb up through really eerie, uh, poorly lit passages. Um, and, and so we have to fight to get up and actually find a new meaning in this game. And um, so the question remains, will we find Yorda again or, or not? And the answer is, um, we really don't, or do we? Uh, I don't know, until now. Um, we probably yeah, you tell me in the end, I don't know. Um, there's some weird double um, sort of like, not, not halfway resolved mysteries around that. Second game, a totally different form of attachment happens in Brothers, a tale of two sons, which is a bit more recent game. It's uh, from 2013 and uh, it's a Swedish fairy tale adventure game in which we, and this is kind of the innovative aspect of this game, um, that we control two characters at the same time, solving puzzles in space. Uh, so we do that by moving two thumbsticks uh, on a controller. So here we have little brother on one thumbstick and big brother on the other one. So this controller, physically speaking, is equally shared among the brothers and the, um, and the controls are sort of necessary at all times to solve the game's puzzle. So it's absolutely, we're ex absolutely active on both sides and um, that's a bit different from how it was in ICO where there's only one button on one side that represents direct attention to this one person. So there's this notion of shared space. Um, and what we do, uh, we navigate the brothers around to uh, weather a lot of dangers in the world. And in many parts of the game, we find conspicuous contraptions which can only be used by two people. So we do that. And um, so the brothers help each other climb up and also swing on ropes that are quite dangerous. That was one of the most exciting moments for me when I played the game. Um, is there, who has played brothers? Uh, do you agree that this rope swinging sequence was a bit kind of thrilling? And of, okay, yeah, I'm maybe 
easy to entertain, but for me it was quite thrilling to sort of see that these brothers uh, switched uh, from one, uh, one brother holding the other and the other one was hanging down. So there's this trust exercise where we really have to press the right buttons to make the brothers support each other. So they want to, they trust each other, but are we good enough as players to support this trust? Are we good enough to support this relationship? That was a really powerful moment. And um, yeah, um, so the, the brothers kind of fall if we, uh, if we uh, fail as, as players, um, which is similar to this death as failure, but in this case it was about more about realizing the relationship, which was something different. Um, yeah, and something at stake. And building up this attachment through the haptic space of the controllers is quite essential for the end of the game. Because, um, surprise, one of the brothers dies kind of five, four, fifths into the game, like close to the end. Um, because in this death of this brother, this control is really elegantly used to represent commemoration and remembering the dead. Um, how is that done? Um, well, we have been, as players, we have been conditioned to thinking that the brothers can only, they need each other's company to master obstacles in the world. Like, some, for instance, swimming through water. Little brother, who is the surviving brother, has a water phobia, so we know that he doesn't dare to go into waters, but in the end, when big brother is gone, what the player can do is to activate both thumbsticks, which makes little brother remember his brother's support and makes it through the waves. Um, so this mechanic reminded me uh, of a concept I found in grief studies, which is called inner representations. And these inner representations means that uh, it's a feeling of the bereaved people, like the spirit of the dead or the memory of the dead uh, inside of them helps them be stronger, feel protec protected, and um, manage certain tasks that they would not without the help of the dead, so to speak. Okay, third example. Um, that's also a Swedish game, Shelter. Who has played it? Fewer people. Okay, so we go f down, slowly down to the territory of the uncharted <laughs> small games. Um, in this game, this is actually a permadeath game. It's, it's a, um, uh, themed as a cycle of nature game. So we play as a, a badger parent who tries to nourish uh, their children and get them safely through a dangerous forest. And um, some dangers include night attacks and predators and forest fires and all kinds of things that happen in a forest. Um, and then, of course, the natural enemy of children, the hunger. So they, these kids, the babies, badger babies, can die from all kinds of causes. And when they die, they die. Um, there's no going back, there's no safe game. Um, we have to play again. Uh, so, um, yeah. There's there's some hunting mechanics that are, that we're shown. So this badger mother really has to try hard to kind of actually provide and protect the young. Um, so, and this relationship of caring for each other is also kind of suggested on the visual level. You see that the difference between maybe you see it in this uh, on the slide that there's a bigger body and then there are small bodies. So we, we see the relationship of the one who takes care and the smaller ones who are have to be protected, um, who are vulnerable, and kind of your actions depend on their survival, or the other way around, their survival depends on your action. Um, and these kids are also connected to their parent through an invisible thread. So you, you just have a, um, an AI that follows the, the big one. And uh, they, they just follow their parent wherever they go, even, to in, even if you, they follow you into death, basically. Um, and this, so, so the, what is different f in this game is that loss or grief is not directly represented, but the player is kind of put into a place where they just deal with it silently. 
So each, since it's permadeath and the kids can die anytime, each play session is different. There's no staged grief, no staged death. So players are super left alone with their feeling of losing um, a kid. And when I first played it, what happened to me is that I lost all of my kids, of course, because I'm a bad gamer. So, um, so what happened is that they died. One of them died in a wildfire. One of them died in the water. One of them, I can't really recall. At some point, I gave up and I was like, "Okay, fuck this. I want to, uh, I want to be free. I just go my own way now." And this was not really possible because what's happening in this game is that if you lose all your children, you have no point in life. Your only point as a parent is to feed and provide and protect. So, um, by the way, this is not on purpose. This is just an emergent. Um, sort of um, mechanic that, that, just, that was just uh, supported by these kind of rules, because when I talked to the creators, they were shattered and actually told me that this was not the point to actually represent bereaved motherhood or parenthood as something that's pointless. But actually, it's something that's quite common in literature and in film and in sort of like media representations, that a representation of motherhood is something that, um, and, and parenthood, uh, especially motherhood, as a, um, is a kind of performance that is characterized by sacrifice. So this idea that you're worthless unless you protect and provide um, is something that Shelter kind of incidentally repeats uh, uh, through the yeah through the death of and, and it becomes more visible through the death of your children. So uh, what is also not very common in video games uh, generally is that uh, focus is on the mother. I mean, in Shelter you can say it could be any parent, um, even though the creators in the end, in the credits, thank their mothers, which is interesting. Um, but uh, motherhood is not something that's like widely, widely discussed. And when it comes to bereaved motherhood, there's even less there. Um, even though there would have been a chance, if you think of this game, who knows this game? Uh, who has played it? I know plenty of people know it, but who has played it? Okay, so um, in this case I also talked to the creators and uh, they also uh, explained, both of them, that um, the idea here was to, to kind of represent, it, uh, build a, a memorial around, oh, a memorial sort of game to um, honor their, um, their son, Joel. And, um, but in the game, it is a story about the father and how he uh, tells the story of this uh, process and, uh, and, and the grief and also the attachment. So you can already see in this picture that it's very um, daddified. So has anyone heard of the daddification of games? Okay, so uh, so that's basically just the, the the idea that now game creators b uh, grow up, and since most game creators are men, white men, uh, one must add, uh, now suddenly the issues like fatherhood are introduced as motivations for the heroes to kill other men. Um, so um, that's statification, and it I would argue that it goes beyond that; it it, it continues until death, so to speak. So for me, that was that was um, also a um, good reminder to work with grievers and work with other kinds of grievers, um, and fill this important gap of um, losing a child from a maybe from a more maternal perspective. Um, so. That, that kind of uh, sharpened this resolution, okay, I want to do something and I want to uh, invite grievers into, into an actual project and make a game with them. And this, of course, raised the question, how can we invite people's experiences into games? So that is a big question and uh, um, I still haven't found, there is not no single answer, but what I want to share with you is kind of the approach that I found for this particular project. Um, so the methods or the approaches that I came up with, they don't come out of the blue, uh, but they, um, they have histories in the plural. And one of these histories is a long-standing tradition of participatory 
game design and um, it's, more, it's more recent mapping to game development. So participatory design proper emerged as a politically motivated methodology and it was driven by unions and workers to include users and end users in the design process of their future working environments. So it started in this workforce context. But in game development contexts, you might know this book, uh, the importance of the user has been emphasized as well. Um, and uh, especially in, in so-called player or play-centric design. Um, and this is uh, one example is Tracy Fullerton's game design workshop. If you are a game designer, I really recommend this book to you. Probably you have already noticed it. Um, and it's uh, right now it's in its fourth edition, so that tells us something about the popularity of, of, of user-centered game design. Uh, so also for many studios out there, it's essential uh, that to test their ideas and their concepts with players. I must say like almost finished ideas or, or concepts are, are usually tested with players um, or even fully formed concepts. And in participatory design, however, it goes a step further. Um, it, insists, it insists on the inclusion of users and experienced experts very early on. So um, this can have two advantages. I found first, it, it grounds technology in the world of real players and, and their needs. And secondly, it also lets these needs inspire new technologies and maybe new approaches uh, for use. And this was exactly what I wanted with introducing maybe new groups to make a, a loss game. Um, I'll skip that part, I think. Um, about the setup, um, who I worked with. So um, the, the group of women I worked with to kind of um, make this grief-based game is, was four white women in their 30s uh, from Austria who responded to a, to a call channeled through a self-help group, the group Regenbogen, which in German means rainbow. And um, I worked on this game with students from the Alberg University and they were predominantly male and white and they were engineering students in their 20s uh, who took this course making this game as, um, as an elective at the Alberg University Copenhagen. I had a lot of freedom working with them so we really had a lot of, we had one semester to figure out a method for doing that. Uh, so the, the development process was, uh, was three months and uh, during which the students uh, made this game, Jokoi, that I mentioned before and will mention later a bit. Um, and when it came to the women, though, who joined the project, their motivations were manifold, or basically it was they were both politically and personally motivated. So uh, on the political level, they, they shared the hope, that, uh, to uh, the hope to create awareness about pregnancy loss, because that was the experience that they went through. And um, they wanted to kind of destigmatize de this subject. Um, but they had no particular interest in video games. They actually hated video games. Um, and and the, the idea of what they thought were video games or what video games could be. And I was totally on their side with that, actually. Um, and, uh, but they were really enthusiastic about uh, the outlook of being included. Um, so and then on a personal level, um, there was this hope that they could make something to remember and celebrate their children um, or their experience of motherhood, even beyond death. Um, and they expressed this in a way in which they gave their fetuses names and spoke of them as children. Okay, so uh, again, they had this, these inner representations that I mentioned before, this idea that staying connected to the dead would help them in their personal life actually uh, become or be a better self. And the students had the motivation to basically just complete their BA and, um, and get course credits and to create something innovative and something that would have a deep message. So in short, these two groups had very different motivations to join the project. So my teaching challenge in the setting was to find a way to facilitate a conversation between these groups. Um, and, um, and an additional challenge, of course, was that these groups, as you might guess, were located in different 
countries and spoke different languages. So I had to find a kind of cross-cultural method to, to mediate between them. And one such technique of mediation was I found in a really cool approach called Muse-based game design by Rilla Collette. Is there anyone who's ever heard of that? Wow, okay, cool. <laughs> one person. <laughs> um, so Rilla suggests that dividing the roles uh, in a design team uh, between those who inspire and those who create, like those who inspire are the muses and those who create are the artists or developers, can create a helpful structure uh, to this participatory design process. Or in Rilla's words, and content warning, long quote, but I will read it. Um, Muse-based game design is an experimental, empathic design approach foregrounding a dialogic artist-muse relationship between a game designer and a player. Following a user research stage focused on learning about the player, the, design, uh, the designer forms idiosyncratic design constraints inspired by and relating to the player, which are then used to inspire ideation. In Rilla's original uh, pedagogic setting, the students are the one conducting this research stage. Uh, but in our intercultural setting, um, it was more useful to uh, gather Muse's data beforehand myself and then provide it in a semi-processed shape at the beginning of a class. So the data uh, handed to the students included images and transcribed conversations of a Muse workshop that I had carried out before the semester started. And um, so I ran this Muse workshop in which the women explored a single question. What did their relationship to their babies or children feel like? And they um, explored this question through an imagination exercise. And to give you a uh, glimpse into what this imagination exercise uh, was like or felt like, uh, I would uh, ask you to do this exercise briefly with me. It will take two, two minutes or less even. Um, so um, if you want to join, um, close your eyes and sit up tall. Or if you don't close your eyes, you can fixate this spot in front of you. Um, so sit up tall and take a deep breath in. And breathe out. And then think of someone you have a close connection with. It could be anyone. Could be a friend or a lover or a family member or a pet. Uh, it could be someone who is dead or someone who is alive. But please pick someone that you feel safe with. Okay. So now you're traveling to visit this person, where, where they live right now. I imagine that they live on a s in a space, it could be a planet, that only you can visit. Uh, what do you see? What do you hear? Is there anything you hear? And who is there? If you looked around and you kind of see your surroundings, what can you do there? Is there anything you can do there? Anything you can't do there? Okay. You uh, have now researched this place enough. If you think you want to leave it, you can Slowly open your eyes, for those you have closed them. Just register how it felt like for you to be in the space, whether there was any images at all or not. Um, in our case, this exercise served, of course, to establish a physical sort of um, symbolic 
connection to to the relationship or to the to the, the loss experience because in the case of our group we conducted this exercise to make the parents symbolically visit their children and then create planets on which they, these children lived. Um, and these are the planets that were modeled in response to this exercise. Um, so the mothers created metaphorical images um, and eventually mock-ups of their relationships. And uh, these mock-ups were speculative and highly informative about current the current grief situation. Um, in other words, these mothers started a process of symbolic modeling here. And they constructed haptic worlds, which then my students could engage with over the course of the semester. And um, yes, this was basically what I sort of documented for them as a starting point towards designing the game. So when I went about constructing the teaching ma uh, materials, including these pictures, uh, I noticed in great horror the risk that I had set up myself with this method. <laughs> um, because I could translate and transcribe uh, what, what has had been said uh, and done in the workshop, but um, would I be able to honor all the small gestures uh, creating effective bonds between the muses and myself? Um, all the small talk, the laughs, the nods, the coffee breaks, and, and also, most importantly, the collective sweating that happened when we, uh, when we conducted this workshop in a very hot Austrian July day. Um, that was kind of lost in translation, right? So um, all of this, of course, contributed to how the mock-ups were created. So how could I possibly um, lose this information? But ironic, so ironically, this was my observation, ironically, the act of writing about experience erases already some of it. And, um, but on the other hand, this created some, some room, some speculative room for my dev team to engage with these models on their own terms and uh, observe aesthetics, mechanics, and dynamics that these mock-ups invoked in them. So what, what speculations did, did these mock-ups inspire? And, and how did the students connect to, to these worlds? And what were important questions uh, for them to start making a game? So um, this is how Choco was created. And this takes me to making this actual game. Um, so as already mentioned, it was the outcome of a three months process. And um, in the end, the game revolved around a story of a mother sheep nurturing and losing a lamb on a colorful meadow. And we clearly learned a bit from shelter there. Um, but uh, in the, the process of designing this game started somewhere completely else, namely with this model, which uh, was a mock-up that drew our attention very early on in the process. And we called this mock-up the cave. So the cave was built by a woman who defined her setting in the most excruciating amount of detail. So she already called it a game to begin with. And the cave was composed of two layers, an inner cave and an outer cave surrounded by an island. So already uh, intricate level design. Um, inside the cave lived the baby, which had to be nourished by an army of playable characters, all of them family members and friends. Uh, and the goal of the cave was to make the family leave the uh, planet in a spaceship. Um, but first they needed to uh, collaborate to make the baby grow enough to be left behind safely. So that was kind of the premise of the game. Uh, and first, of course, there was some collective enthusiasm among the students. This was a model with mechanics, with goals, with a setting. Um, and the symbolic process kind of worked. So the planet exercise neatly translated into a game. And if the team succeeded, most importantly, to translate this model into a game, wouldn't, wouldn't that, that be a, a rock solid way to express authentic grief experience? 
Uh, so the students created a paper prototype and added features, multiple playable characters, multi-layer level design, customizable audio and lighting, lock and key puzzles, shape-shifting, feeding and holding mechanics, and atmosphere which conveyed being in an internal space. Uh, oh, and what if you could also build the spaceship, right? So um, the feature list grew and grew, and uh, so did the doubts as to how this was co could be possibly achieved within the constraint of a three-month project. Um, at the same time, and th there was the panic uh, also growing, leaving out the slightest detail from the mock-up, wouldn't that necessarily mean misrepresenting the women? So, this was a good moment to, to step back and remember the laws and limitations of representation. Uh, who here knows Stuart Hall? Oh, wow, a lot of people, cool. Um, according to this British scholar, a media scholar, Stuart Hall, representation does not reflect reality. And this is a very important and hard to grasp um, concept. I struggled with it for years, but it is actually quite liberating. It constructs uh, and doesn't, it's, uh, it, it constructs our world. It is not inside, or it's not outside of an event. It's not um, after an event but within the event itself. Representation is inside of the event. It's constitutive of it. It's very hard to grasp, but this meant that, this also suggests that it is virtually impossible to represent truth, not even through engineering. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, for, m for my students, this meant uh, learning uh, to embrace their own interpretations of the planet mock-ups. So, what did they feel and see and understand about the mock-ups? And what constructed their genuine truth about the models? And this insistent, uh, insistence on embracing what personally speaks to you is something I also learned from, from Doris Rouge's work on symbolic game design in her insightful book, which I very much recommend, Making Deep Games. Uh, Doris recommends to rely on the developer's personal symbols uh, and and associations when creating uh, games about emotional personal subjects. Um, I would add that this especially that is especially true for participatory settings. Uh, so rather than overwriting the statement of your partner in a process to to represent them truly, which is impossible. Use your own uh, different words and your genuine uh, response to work with. So this, of course, puts us in a vulnerable place, but remember this is being vulnerable is a game development skill. And I truly believe that, and I believe that this should be taught in development, in especially engineering classes. So when taking our own perspective seriously as engineers, um, and when my students did that, they started identifying symbols uh, in the mockups that interested them more than others. Um, so they started to see also they started to see blind spots in the women's conversations, which were essential for us to understand the grief experience. For instance, uh, the women had taken a perspective of survivorship and making really beautiful landscapes instead of the griever, which is a different role. So death was more of an unspoken reality framing their models uh, and their wish to st uh, so the wish to stay safe and connected to the babies was in the center. So they didn't talk directly about their loss. Um, and to honor this reality of death, um, the students decided to model loss in, a, a, in Choco's control scheme as well. And we talked about that, how we could also learn from other games. Um, so in the game, the player first builds up a connection between the mother sheep and the lamb through a shared control. In this case, it's the left mouse button. Um, and in the, in the beginning, both of these mouse buttons are available. One can both feed the lamb and oneself. Uh, uh, but after the lamb is lost in an earthquake, the button which used to facilitate this, this child care is no longer available. So this is supposed to make feel a, uh, players feel a sense of loss, uh, again on a physical haptic level of gameplay rituals, which worked so, so nicely in previous games. Um, 
Yeah, and one of the most daunting questions uh, was how to teach suitable methods for evaluating Choco. How do you evaluate a game like this? How do you test this? Um, so I decided to let students figure it out by themselves, and this le led to some really interesting frustrations. Um, for, for the first iteration of the game, the students decided to conduct, conduct usability tests. Um, everyone knows what a usability test is? So how well does the game um, work, right? So the main concern was functionality, which, which the students divided into two questions. Did the players know what to do? And did the players know what to feel? So uh, while the first part returned clear results, the second part, so the second question, did the players feel the right thing, uh, produced really messy data. The play testers, uh, seem to be incapable of identifying their own emotions by choosing the correct options in the spreadsheet. Um, so this uncertainty uh, of, of these outcomes confused and frustrated my students a lot. Um, and it took some work to unpack what was the, at the root of their frustrations. So as it turned out, uh, the questionnaire had been built on a common myth that is often used in effective engineering and game design video games with emotions. Um, the idea that uh, developers can engineer user emotions by making correct design choices or offering them to feel something, right? This is one of the, uh, one of the examples. Um, so in this paradigm, an information unit is triggered whenever a user interacts with technology. That's like how emotion works. Um, and um, this myth is summarized in the brilliant research of, of Kirsten Böhner and colleagues uh, who write that in effective computing, af effect is often taken to be another kind of information. Discrete units or states internal to an individual that can be transmitted in a loss-free manner from people to computational systems and back. And this myth, of course, suits engineers because it translates complex, it suggests that it can translate complex emotion into quantifiable information units. Uh, but scientifically speaking, um, there is not much evidence that that's how emotion works. Uh, um, instead, what the research suggests is that emotion is more like a web of messy interactions and uh, in rather than information units. Um, so for my students, the question was what user experience methods were out there to measure emotion as interaction. And there are very few. What we did in the end was that um, we, we used a method called cultural probes. Has anyone heard of that method? Great, three people. Um, this method was first used uh, in the context of urban design by Bill Gaver and colleagues. and. Uh, Cultural probes are basically just uh, small activity packs which are given uh, to users in the hope for inspirational feedback. So the package is handed over in a little ritual and after that the user engages with the contents and hopefully returns some of them. Um, so in most cases, uh, probes are used as a way to establish a relationship, um, a connection with an un between an unknown participant and a research team. Uh, in our case, uh, it served as a tool for reconnecting and testing the second iteration of the game with our muses. And um, the package uh, contains some of these things, postcards, a game prototype, and a personalized scrapbook. And these materials were supposed to invite the muses to rethink and think about their, the workshop, and uh, the game prototype maybe add a, uh, some materials to the models uh, and uh, just also think again about their mother-child relationship. Maybe something has changed over the time. So on the day the probes were launched, the disadvantages of this very loose method became relatively clear. Um, two of the muses, two of the four muses had to cancel the ritual and then had technical issues with the prototype. Um, so since the probe contents were dependent on each other, they had to be returned blank, some of them at least. And, um, 
but the probe contents that were sent back to us um, were really of great value for polishing this, uh, for polishing Chokoi and for kind of understanding a bit more in depth wha what was important for the muses. So by now the students had, had learned that the muses were supposed to inspire rather than dictate the process and the probes offered an additional support in crafting an appropriate atmosphere and the feel the right feel for the game. So, so overall, what the students had learned from, from exploring um, quantitative versus qua uh, speculative uh, UX and what we um, sort of uh, discovered together in this process was really that this value of associative and ephemeral feedback from, from participants and um, that feedback that we get from players or participants during the process is maybe le less quantifiable, but it's also more rich if you use the right methods for that. So, this takes me to a conclusion or some conclusive thoughts um, about why play with grief. Um, so, I think that overall, during these years in which I've worked with grief games or trying to understand grief game mechanics or this question of how can we honor grief experience has really told me a lot about um, how games can potentially honor um, our attachments and grief experiences. Um, so, first, looking for games which represent attachment and loss uh, was a way of taking human experience seriously, for me at least. It was also told me something about maybe other, maybe grief is a niche subject that is important for me and millions of other people, but in, 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 the, in research terms, it was a niche subject, uh, but it also expanded to other areas of human experience and how this could be introduced in, in future game design. And secondly, uh, developing games with grievers was a really good way of confronting some basic myths in video game production and engineering. So um, these myths about emotions as uh, quantifiable units or as, um, you know, the starting myth of death is failure, um, kind of getting rid of these myths or unpacking these myths uh, is also a way of updating um, video game production or design to respect the real world and each other. So um, I call it games that care, uh, for, for lack of other words, it's tacky, but that's like my working title for that sort of phenomenon. Um, so it's, it's important that, that one source of respect, that's also one finding, is one's own vision. So. Um, Games that care do not simply care about players or participants or in-game representations. They also care about uh, those who make them. So they commit to decisions which, which, resonate and, um, which resonate with and validate creators. And um, yeah, as means of a small epilogue, um, what this, this project has shown me, months after the end of this project, one of the participants asked me to present the game, Jokoi, at the self-help group networking event in Vienna. Um, and uh, I was strolling through the room and I noticed a heavy photo album in, in near to the entrance of, of this group's building, office, office building. And, uh, and, and I casually flipped through this, photo album and stumbled over a section that's called Our Morning Game. And uh, that contained two, two photographs from the project. So, uh, I can't recall that these photographs were taken anywhere, but, but these images were carefully arranged uh, and glued on this, this thick blue paper. And one of them showed a still from the game and the other one showed um, two of the muses looking over my shoulder while we were playing the game or while I showed them how to play. And again, I have no recollection of this photo being taken, but finding this casual this page in this album reminded me of the real purpose of this project. Um, by, by including the muses into, into a simple BA development course and the, uh, just developing a, a, a small game, uh, we had incidentally created um, a memorial technology for them 
which they were both uh, keen on showing to others and keeping for themselves as a cherished memory. So by, by going through a process of careful engineering and, and responsive engineering, uh, we had helped found this entirely new user context of grief-based development and, and contributed to a meaningful dialogue around a st stigmatized subject. So um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sabine, for an amazing talk and a, such an interesting topic that we don't talk too much in games. Um, is there any questions from the audience? We have a mic for you if you have something to ask. And while you think about it, I can ask, okay, well, there's the first question, so I can save mine to next. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, pretty simple. I mean, for example, when you I don't know, read a book uh, or watch a movie or watch a series or play a game, you get somehow emotionally involved in it and you start like caring for like certain uh, character or some other character. So what do you think that uh, is the best effective way to make really care about this kind of character and like make you feel like you're like, you really are in into the game? This is, wow, <laughs> okay. Thank you for this question. I think this is actually uh, not as simple as we think, this question, because a uh, lot of people have struggled with um, making effectively, uh, effectively emotional characters, um, e of characters that people bond with. But actually what, what is documented in research especially in the wonderful um, study uh, um, Players, Gamers at the Edge, I think it's called, Gaming at the Edge by Adrian Shaw. Uh, she made like a really um, in-depth study about exactly about this question. How do players identify with characters? And what, is what she found is that it is very situational how people want to identify with characters. So the idea of making a game that is effective and reaches everyone is a myth that we have to sort of get rid of because it doesn't respect the um, real life choices of actual players, some of who do not want to identify. There was one particular moment in this book that, that I found really funny, which was um, a, a woman of color who played God of War and really loved this game, but she also said that this guy there, it's just a guy, this guy, just the thing on screen holding my knives, <laughs> right? So she, she didn't play for identification, she played for the gratification of just smashing someone's face maybe, I don't know. But <laughs> there is different motives and even the motive of this identification that is of course um, sort of like natural when you, when you think about it, that you will probably be in situations where you feel less or more inclined to really deeply connect. Sometimes you do just don't want to deeply connect to some characters because they, they don't interest you, but the game still interests you. So there is room for, for lots of different um, emotional states, so to speak. Uh, and and, and this, this idea of, of emotion being more like a web of interactions rather than um, a simple thing also relates to your question because um, it really highlights that we can have different emotional states at the same time. Uh, I don't know, I, I at least feel like I have sometimes thousands of emotional <laughs> states at, at, at the same time. And we can even intrapersonally change a lot depending on what, how we interact with our surroundings and, and also how we interact with, with a game, for instance. So it's complicated, basically. That's, that's super interesting because we kind of maybe sometimes modeled uh, human experiences in very simplistic ways because mm -hmm. it, it, there is a benefit for that, obviously, because yes. it's easier to make games that have very simple yes. models. But we need to remember that this is disrespecting actual people, that respecting humans means to accept the com complications or mm -hmm. the complexities. That's good. Um, while you prepare more questions, I have one question. So. 
you're using participatory design process in, in this particular case and probably also other uh, ones as well. If you, if someone here in the audience would like to also create a participatory process, how would you start, where to find more information and what kind of, what, what, how is the process of setting up the participatory game design process? So for me, it was because I have a background in humanities, it was a bit about reading, but also getting in touch with people who have also had experiences doing it. So I'm available if you have any questions and you want to start, uh, you have a, maybe a particular idea and you want to involve others, I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of point you to some sources or to share my experiences with it more than in this talk. Um, but I think it's important to talk to others who have made experiences because sometimes it can be scary. So this process of making maybe a game by yourself in your own behind your own closed door is, is something you can do and imagine. But then going into the world and working with these scary others, it's is at least for me it was quite a, a move um, away from my comfort zone. So depending on what group or people you want to work with, there's plenty of different methods, and I found. With Muse-based game design, I think, was a good starting point for accommodating a group that, wa that wanted to do nothing to do with video games, and they didn't feel like creators. They felt like um, they were there to, to share their expertise about experience, and this is a valid position. We can learn a lot from that, but it means that we can't, um, for instance, we can't use a model that would uh, force some video game development work on them, right? because that would burden them with work that they don't want to do. And we, I think this is also one of the things we have to be careful with participatory game design, to not overburden participants um, and make them work out something that we should work out. Mm. Yeah, but um, sorry, it's just a very long story. Yeah, so basically just <laughs> yeah. to engage with others. Yeah, engage with others. Process. And then some of these sources I put, um, uh, Rilla Colette's Muse-based game designer can recommend as a starting point. It's really readable also as you know, and I think that also has some, some links in the, in the bibliography to other approaches that have, have been, um, has a really good section on, on the history of participatory game design or the lack thereof, because the history of participatory game design is not that long. Mm. Any new questions from the audience? Okay, I'll, I'll continue, maybe there is uh, one coming up. So, um, I, w I was thinking that uh, what was the, because you also were kind of, kind of the muse for the process, right? Because of your own loss. So how do you, uh, like, is it, is it different to do a participatory design process with when you are not yourself experiencing the things that people have experienced? You probably were able to translate more from the, from the workshop to the, the creators. How does that work? So, so that's that's an interesting one because I was very careful to kind of exclude my experience from this project, and I know now that was because I was scared. I was scared to put myself in the center with mm -hmm. my experience. Maybe it's not something that's relatable for anyone. I had this feeling that it, it would, it, it just felt. Um, too daunting for me. Mm -hmm. So that was maybe the reason why I moved to a group. Ma let's make it more relevant for everyone by mm -hmm. inviting an actual group and looking at the common experiences of them. There were some experiences that they uh, talked about, most of them actually, that I couldn't relate to. Mm -hmm. So most of these models, my game would have, been, have, would have looked much darker, I think, <laughs> or like much more trashy. Mm -hmm. um, I, didn't, I didn't really, uh, for me it was, it was beauty was not so important. For them it was really important. So. Uh, in, the, in the process of this participatory design, I would say I really try to step out and mediate mm. and really remind myself that this time it's not about me. But I think that the whole uh, setup of the group and the access I had to this group was, for that it was very important that I had this shared experience of losing a kid because I think that, um, that they trusted me for mm. that reason. And I think that, um, so this is also maybe a good advice for all of us, we have access to different groups, to different social settings, um, and, and to our surroundings, friendship groups, whatever, hobbies. Um, if you want to make a game about, I don't know, um, miniature sh check, uh, whatever, and you're part of this hobbyist group, you have a better access there, and you can probably access a group that I can't access, right? Um, you 
you have a trusting relationship to people that don't trust me. So, so this is something that is like a big motivation for, for doing a participatory game project because it fe feels powerful to be able to access uh, um, a setting that not everyone can access. Mm. That's very exciting. There is one question. Can we get the mic? Thank you for the beautiful talk. <laughs> Just go okay. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was wondering, like, there's many different stages. So when would be maybe a good or a safe point to start making a game based on your loss? I think so. So one one chapter in this in my thesis kind of debunks this stage model of grief because there have been a lot of stage models of grief, all of which have different stages and different numbers of stages, and it ranges from two to six. And people completely disagree. Um, what what would be the what is the perfect model for this grief process, the universal grief process? The the reality that I that works for me. Uh, the model that works for me is a belief in idiosyncratic, like personal uh, experience, and there's no model that captures. There's no one size fits all model for grief. So I would say it's never safe. It can it can be that tomorrow I have a relapse, and you can no longer talk to grief uh, about grief with me. It's very unlikely, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that. Um, it it is a matter of how who do you talk to, right? And and letting uh, listening instead of um, assuming, oh okay you're now in this stage so I can safely talk to you uh, because you're in the anger stage that explains why you look at me strange. <laughs> um, I, if I feel this is a bit for me it was at least very dehumanizing when people assumed something about my grief. For instance, mm -hmm. I, I can never be happy again or I cannot laugh. People were super irritated when I laughed briefly my after my loss because I was now in the, that, that meant I was in the denial stage, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that um, that a respectful way of, of uh, doing this would be to, to ask and be transparent about your motives also. Why do you want to engage uh, and, and what is your role in, in, this, um, in this relationship? Because then it, it becomes more genuine rather than outsourcing that into a safe model. Does that make sense? ask like did you have any when you were working with the muses or with the students for that for instance did you have any kind of techniques or anything like like how did you make sure that everyone was as safe as they could yes be? yeah so again i think that one one model that really helps with safety is symbolic talking because that was also that's also widely reported in gr in grief consultancy literature where um, if you if you make grievers find symbols for what they're currently experiencing they choose their own words they they, cho they also choose incidentally models that are safe for them for instance one of these losses was very recent of um, of one of the group participants and she chose to um, use symbols that were um, that were not addressing death at all. So she made a, a really safe world for herself. Uh, when you looked closely, there were craters on the planet that were dangerous. But then she corrected herself and said, "It's actually not dangerous, right?" So what she did there was symbolically speaking, she was making her world safe for herself. And she was not because she was not willing to share these these wounds with us. She covered them up. And that was totally acceptable because we were talking inside of a model. Had I directly asked her, say something about your grief, say something about your loss, uh, it would have maybe triggered some uh, a situation in which uh, that would have been very uncomfortable for her. But since we were working symbolically with this planet metaphor, where they could choose how to embed their dead children in the planets, right? So maybe. For her, there weren't any dangers at all because everything was safe for her. Whereas, for instance, so 
this is also interesting because these muses had very different um, sta uh, sta stages or states in their uh, grief process. So one of them um, uh, uh, was um, uh, had had a experience that was ten years ago, right? And this uh, muse was chose to also look at the the painful sides. That was the cave model, where you also there was a, an end point, and we actually need to leave this planet, right? And we actually, this, this kid needs to survive. There's also a chance that it will not survive if we don't nourish it enough, for instance, right? So there's different, um, um, these muses had, and that was what, what I call this like experience competence or experience expertise, that grievers know what they need uh, when you let them talk and find uh, appropriate metaphors for what they're going through. That's super helpful to understand how to do the process in a respectful yeah. way. At least I think I think mm. at least it's a case for people who want to talk about their grief because all of them, all of the muses signed up to talk about it. They wanted uh, their experience uh, of pregnancy loss to be destigmatized, and they wanted to kind of share something about their stories. So I think that that is also an indicator uh, an indicator for how you can do it respectfully. If you, someone wants to talk to you, you can you can make it so that they do it on their own terms. That's very nice. I'm gonna ask the last question and then we can uh, join the coffee table and continue discussions here in location. But would you want to do another kind of a game on grief or other kind of topic for participatory, participatory design? What would be your kind of future dream project? Future dream projects, no. Um, <laughs> on, um, on, on this topic, kind of, or, uh, or kind oh, of somehow topic. related to this. Yeah, um, I don't really know. I mean, I maybe have had enough of the se seven years of PhDing on this. Um, <laughs> but um, it really felt like a, a cathartic process where now I'm done with this topic and now I'm doing other stuff like whiteness and racism, which is like uh, uh, another um, super um, interesting topic which is hard to tackle but um, it's uh, yeah it, I've kind of moved a bit away from it uh, but maybe if I would do it um, again I think I would I would be maybe courageous enough now to take my own experience seriously mm -hmm. and like just work with myself as a muse slash designer mm -hmm. And like, uh, uh, and maybe, um, yeah. Again, like, uh, overcome this feeling of self-indulgence, of uh, this, this. You know, we know this from 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 indie games or underground games. The author, um, author, mm -hmm. um, persona who who makes a game about life and the human condition. Like, I, I don't, I don't necessarily need to fall in this trap, but um, yeah, that that could be maybe one project. Mm. But we're looking forward to that project and uh, the other projects as well and follow your work uh, afterwards. Um, so yeah, this is Games Now and uh, make sure that you follow our channel so that you can catch lectures like this. Um, and uh, I think that we will be now moving to the fun part of drinking some coffee and tea and other refreshments as well. And we thank everybody online and also here in the, in the location. And after we've closed the stream, we also have a raffle for the dinner tonight. So we have the Games Now dinners, and you can be part of the Games Now dinners by participating to the pre-tasks of the lectures and taking a box of being part of the raffle. So thank you, everybody. I'm, on, I'm Anna Kasakultima, and this is Games Now. We are at Alta University, and please come back on the next lecture. Bye. Thanks for joining.